Hello and welcome to another session of Groundbreakers Live. I'm your host, Javed Mohammed, and I'm very honored to have with us Connor McNano, who is an Oracle developer advocate. Connor, welcome. Thanks for having me, Javed. It's uh, good to be here. I, um, obviously, I wish normally we'd be doing these face to face, literally face to face, but uh, this will have to do. Okay. Um, so, you have a presentation on the Yatra tour, the, the rise and fall and rise again of the SQL database. So uh, is that kind of something like history repeating itself or like, well, what's going on there? Um, I, was, I was motivated to do this talk because I gave a similar presentation uh, in Portugal last year when, when we were still doing, doing uh, attending events. Uh -huh. And it was actually a group of graduates about an introduction to database technology. And at the end of it, um, some of the lecturers who actually taught uh, the database units over there said to me, you know, a lot of that history I never knew myself. So I figured there was probably a talk that would be useful for uh, even those who are regular practitioners with databases. So I call it the rise and fall and rise again, really by just going back and looking at the history of, of database management systems, right back to when there weren't, wasn't even data. Uh, I started with one of the first commercial computers called the ABC. Um, I think it's the Antanasoft Berry computer, I think. Wow, and it was, I've, not, I've not heard of that. Yeah, and, and so it was, it was that rudimentary that it didn't have data. You actually fed instructions into the memory. It did a calculation and, and the results came out. There was no concept even of storing data. It was simply a, a transient thing. You could think of it as a, a, a very, very impressive calculator. And then I moved on to the, the sort of advent of, of storage and, and in the early days that was literally tape disk drives didn't really exist mm -hmm. and it, it moved on to there to to the first disk drives and the first data management systems uh, it, it always gets a bit of a chuckle when you show the picture of one of the first disk drives it's five megabytes and, and it's being loaded onto an aircraft like a fridge uh, you know the, the old days of the, the terabyte sd card sitting on the uh, on the fingertip now uh, was a, a, a distant or it never, it never people never thought we'd ever get to that mm -hmm. But the thing there with, with data management systems was the very, very first data management systems were pretty much key value stores. You could have a key and you would do a read and get all your data. And then as people realized the limitations or all the, not the limitations, the complexities of having to write a lot of code to, to deal with just such a rudimentary system. We went on to things like ISAM and DL1 and, and hierarchical data management stores, which were generally accessed by COBOL because the COBOL logic in terms of copybooks and, and overlays lends itself nicely to hierarchical data stores. And then in the 70s, COD came up with this transformative paper, which was really along the lines of, you shouldn't need to know how to get the data in order to get the data. You know, data could be expressed more along the lines of, of an algebra, in terms of mathematical algebra. And so then we had relational databases and, and Oracle was the first and but, you know, many, many, many followed and have all been incredibly successful. Go Larry Ellison. That was the, the rise of, of, of SQL. And then, um, and then we led into the fall. And the fall was more the fact that as the internet just absolutely exploded, uh -huh. the technologies could scale to a certain amount, which probably, you know, could easily accommodate 99% of the world's data requirements, but for those niche players who are like dealing with billions of users and, and petabytes of data, relational technology maybe wasn't there for that yet. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny how the first, what, what people call them NoSQL systems, but really they were just non-relational systems uh, came into play. And what I, always, what I always chuckle at is the first iterations of those were key value stores. It was literally like going back to the 60s. Mm -hmm. and, and unsurprisingly, people found all those same complexities uh, in terms of dealing with key value stores. And so we moved on to hierarchical systems, just like we did in the 70s. Yeah. And then we, the people started building systems on them. That's why you can see the, um, I suppose, one of the reasons for the explosion of JSON in the sense that it's a hierarchical system, much like um, XML. Mm -hmm. And, and then finally- Sorry, just to, just to ask you, so, so this is all, so when you say this, that the relational database could handle structured data. What we're talking about here is the, all the unstructured data, right? Photos, videos, what, whatever. Oh, else is there. I don't think so. the, the relational database, even as you know, far back as Oracle 7, the relational database has always been 
capable of dealing with unstructured data. I think it was more the volume, the volume and intensity. So um, I know people talk about uh, the four V's of big data. Was it the velocity, variety, uh -huh. veracity? Volume, I don't know. You can look it up. Yeah, there's four V's. <laughs> I should know them. I, I, I have come across it. I just can't remember it like most things. <laughs> But I, I found, um, I, I never really bought into that except for the volume argument. Uh -huh. And it's generally true that there are limits to relational database technology. And, and that's really a, 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 um, a reflection of the way it evolved in the sense that in the days when relational databases were becoming incredibly popular, the entire um, motivation of handling server capacity was bigger. So you had a small server, it ran out of capacity, you made it, you got a bigger one. You, you, that ran out of capacity, you got a bigger one. And so software reflected that. Software reflected the fact that generally you ran databases on a single server that you got bigger and bigger. Uh, probably the exception to that was our Oracle Rack, which was you know, clustered, but still ran on the concept of a shared disk system. So I think software follows hardware, and as hardware basically you know, found it actually couldn't scale forever, uh, when things like the internet came along, it was it was those limitations that people then needed to work around, and so it was more the fact that people said, "Well, if I'm a startup, I can't go buy a monstrous great server. What I'll do is I'll get several servers and 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 use software to try and work around the fact that I actually have multiple things now to manage." Yeah. That's things see things like um, DynamoDB, Cassandra, Hadoop, all all really coming from the Google file system because they were really the pioneers of trying to present lots of little servers as one. Okay, so, so is this just, um, so when you were talking, I'm just thinking, just in the back of my mind, so in my earlier engineering days, you know, we had the concepts of, you know, in the, the, certainly in the world of mainframes, when you talk about COBOL and some of that, the, you know, you had the concept of virtual machines, and I just find it interesting that, you know, we've come back to many of those concepts. So, is this so are we just kind of building up those same concepts and uh, advancing or is it i mean what's your, what's your take on that um, I, th I think always solutions always come to problems uh -huh. um sorry, let me start that again i think solutions that come out of problems generally um stand the test of time i and and don't get me wrong i'm not being critical of no sequel solutions they certainly have their place and if you have uh, reached the limits of what you can do with a relational database, then going to a NoSQL is a natural evolution. It's one of the reasons I'm sure that we have now have a sharding offering inside Oracle in the sense that if you need to geographically distribute for reasons of either uh, robustness or latency or just scale, uh -huh. you can actually have a sharded version of the Oracle database. But I think solutions Get the, the good solutions come as a result of hitting an obstacle. Google couldn't find a database big enough to handle the explosion of internet, and so they built their own, let's call it database, the, the big file system to, to manage that. Where I see um, the danger of this cyclical nature is people who build solutions for problems that don't actually exist yet. And one of the things there is I'm always amazed at the amount of people who I've seen blog posts where people say, oh, yes, we're at our customer site. You know, we, we've, reached, we, we've reached nearly 500 transactions per second now, and our server can't cope. So we're, we're moving to technology X away from technology Y. Uh -huh. And it's one of those strange things where you look at the, the technology they're currently on, and if it's Oracle or it's Postgres or any other relational technology, often... I'm sitting there going, 500 transactions per second. You know, we, we could rattle off a thousand customers that do at least 10 times that amount without a problem, without any drama. So generally it's amazing how people often view uh, their own shortcomings, whether they've not coded an application correctly or whether they're not using the technology correctly or whether they haven't done good database design, et cetera. Often the own shortcomings in terms of approaching a problem, yeah. they go, oh, it's an issue with the technology. We, we need to move to a new technology. Now, don't get me wrong, that keeps you and I and things like that employed <laughs> often. But yeah, I, generally, I, it's amazing how when people come up against obstacles, they think, 
and new technology is the solution. Um, so I, it's funny, there was a, a quote, there's a, let me think, there's a, there's a new product that's being touted by some people who I think used to work for YouTube. They're, I think it's, what's it called? It might be called Planet Scale. They're, they're, they're coming up with a distributed relational database in, mm. in the same flavor, I suppose, as things like uh, Yugabyte and, and stuff like that. But it's funny how one of the quotes that one of the founders says is, relational is the ideal solution for all cases, except where it can't do the job. Mm. And, and he said, he said you know, if YouTube, or if, if relational technologies could have handled the incredible growth in things like YouTube and Google and stuff like that, none of these NoSQL solutions would have ever been invented. You know, no, the problem wouldn't have existed. No one would have ever invented these NoSQL solutions. So NoSQL solutions are almost desperately trying to get to the level of functionality that's been in the relational database world forever. They, they, they have, don't get me wrong, it's not because they're immature. It's more that they have extra challenges because they need to do it at a global scale. But the reality is, if you're a database practitioner of any technology, if you don't need to be at global scale, then you should follow the lead of the people who are doing NoSQL solutions in that they're saying, until you need to go to one of these solutions, go with a relational database for all the benefits. So Connor, when you're speaking, one of the things that's kind of spinning in my mind, and again, this is not, obviously this is Connor talking and not Oracle, because I'm always kind of amazed, but you know, when we talk about big data and everything, and I'm just thinking, where does this end? Like, you know, when we talk about, you can take Moore's law or Metcalf's law, or, or I don't know what the, the law for storage is. I mean, does this just it keep on infinitely scaling as, as time goes on? Or do we hit a wall someplace? Like, what, what, what's your personal take on that? I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. Um, mm -hmm. I saw an quote recently, it's, it's an old quote now, it's from um, um, Eric Smith, the Google CEO. Uh -huh. and I remember he said, um, what was it? I think this might have been in, in 2010, but he said, more data was produced in the last week than has in the history of time before last week. Wow. In, in terms of growth. Now, I'm not sure if that trend has continued, but uh -huh. I'm sure, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I made it, I saw something recently on the internet, which is a water bottle you can buy, like for, you know, for going to the gymnasium and stuff. Uh -huh. And it's, it's Wi-Fi enabled because it will send your phone a message telling you when you need to drink more or when the water bottle is empty. And I'm saying, you know, we have survived as a human species with you know using a, a remarkable piece of technology to work out when a water bottle is empty. Uh -huh. you, know, you pick it up and you look at it or you shake it. <laughs> so, so I think I think the world will continue to find data generation solutions even when no such requirement was needed. It goes, uh, back, so to, it, it goes back to your point about finding solutions to real problems as opposed to manufactured ones. That's right. So I, I think as long as there exists the concept at the moment, which is where there's data to be stored, there's money to be made, uh -huh. I, think, I think data solution, you know, data growth will continue. Mm -hmm. What I do think will happen though is I think the data capture rate will slow eventually, not because of some sort of limit. Uh -huh. I think people will start to become far more protective of the data they're willing to share. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think we've seen, you know, over the last couple of years, people now have, a, you know, it used to be the case that, oh, you know, company X got hacked and the general public will sort of laugh about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now the general public is much more informed about the importance of data, the importance of security of data. And so they have a much more vested interest in what they're prepared to offer up and how it's been protected. Um, you can see the recent bans of, of various you know, uh, phone apps in various countries around the world. Obviously, TikTok's probably the most publicly notable one. Uh -huh. People realize that you know, data generation isn't necessarily such a great thing all the time. Okay. And by the way, while I'm speaking with you, I have to compliment you that the backdrop that you have behind you it's like a perfect setting. I mean, just everything just looks in place and it's just, it looks like a beautiful studio or I, I don't know how to even put it into words. Well, rest assured, this is not my place. <laughs> it's not a virtual background. I'm, I'm just in a, um, in a family member's house. Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they have 
far more discipline in terms of keeping their house in, in a nice state than, uh, than I would be prepared to share with my house. Uh, certainly when we do things at my home, generally I put myself in a corner where you can only see a set of shelves or I put a virtual background out. So, but that's, but I, that too is a great background, by the way, because I have I, talked to you with that, with that background also. I have reasonable confidence, David, uh -huh. in that you are not currently on a hill over the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Astute observation. So on that, on that note, one final thought. So, I mean, this is, obviously this conversation is going on while the, the, the Yatra tour is going on, even though it's virtual. So obviously last year it was in person and you actually did the tour. Is there, I'm sure you have many memories of it because you visited so many cities in such a short time space. Is there like one memory you'd like to sh that, that that you'd like to share? You know, just uh, for nostalgia purposes. Sure. Um, well, you know, and don't get me wrong. I don't want to cast any shade on the events themselves when we're there. Uh -huh. um, but but I, I figured if I mentioned one of the particular events and a particular anything from one event, that's that's being dismissive of all the others. So uh -huh. I'm going to share a memory, which is actually one of the days off we had, which was it uh -huh. was pouring with rain. And Sai took us on a, a lovely drive through the country. We, we ended up at this um, dam, which was overflowing. And what was amazing was, normally as Westerners, you know, it's raining, we sort of go, oh God, it's raining, and we grumble and we bristle. And yet, I can't remember exactly where we were, but we went out to this dam, and it was absolutely packed to the rafters. It was just people sitting there in the flow of the water as it came over the dam with the rains opening. Obviously, none of these people knew us, and yet they would consistently come up and say hi and look at the weather, and, and they'd be huge smiles on their faces. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of, I think, the real tragedies when you think about the, the COVID situation is the ability for people just spontaneously to come together in groups and, and celebrate something. These people were just celebrating the fact that it was raining and, and the dam was overflow, and you know, it was just beautiful. It's just a real outpouring of just sheer happiness. That's one of the things I missed from, from Yatra from last year. Mm -hmm. And you know, on similar levels, even at the events themselves, the enthusiasm of the attendees, uh, the bonds you make with the other speakers, mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping that yeah, one day we'll be back face to face because virtual events are great, uh, but yeah, they, they never ever replace that, um, that enthusiasm that you can get face to face. Absolutely. And with that, uh, uh, Connor, I'll offer you my finger if I, you can see it. I don't know where, but uh, I'm gonna. Get, I like to make that human connection, but we'll have to do be virtual for now. And I kind of seem to show get my get my finger in the frame here for some reason, but it's meant to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Connor, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. See you. Take care, Jabba. Bye bye. Bye bye.